Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number three of our discussion of Out of the Silent Planet by C.S. Lewis. Uh, and I'm excited about tonight's class because this is uh, one of my two favorite bits of this whole book, and that is his meeting uh, with the Hrossa. Um, I really, I really enjoy the Hrossa in general. Uh, and tonight is Hrasa night, uh, so we're gonna we're, we're gonna try to go from uh, we're gonna try to go from his first meeting with Hyoi uh, at the beginning of uh, of that of you know of this whole interlude, all the way through his parting from uh, uh, from the the Hrasa. So we'll see we'll see how well we do there. Okay. A couple quick announcements first, uh, just to remind you about upcoming moots. We have three moots, which are all now currently taking registrations. We have a uh, uh, text moot, which is happening on the 8th of February, uh, and uh, that is, of course, fast approaching. Uh, so get your uh, tickets for text moot while you can. Join us down in, uh, uh, in, in, in Houston. It's going to be a lot of fun just a, a couple weeks from now on the 8th of February. Uh, we also have early bird registration for Mythmoot that is uh, open now. Uh, so if you haven't seen that, that is, uh, that is a big piece of news. Join us for Mythmoot 7. Uh, defying and Defining the Darkness is our theme. Um, and the call for papers should be, uh, uh, should be out soon. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly, but it should be out soon. Anyway, and the uh, the the um, the uh, the registration, as I say, is open for that. So that's uh, pretty exciting. Oh, Devora, sorry you can't make it to Texmoot this year. I was hoping to be able to see you again. I was I was uh, thinking through last night. I was talking about Texmoot, and I was just kind of thinking about the the folks from uh, from here and from exploring the Lord of the Rings that I got to meet at Texmoot last year. So I was uh, I was uh, thinking about that. Sorry. So I won't be able to see you this year. Maybe next year. Um, anyway, so that's happening. And of course, third, we have uh, um, we have SoCal Moot out uh, in L.A. Uh, it's going to be hosted at the Netflix headquarters in Hollywood. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and um, anyway, yeah. So uh, so that's uh, that that's coming up. And registration is open for all three of those things. So, uh, so very good. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. I think that was most of what I wanted to talk about uh, for our announcements here tonight. Let us move forward so that I we can uh, uh, see if we can make some good progress here. Uh, in our oh yeah, sorry. One one last thing. Um, uh, Mootcast. Yeah, we are, of course, doing Mootcast again this year uh, for Mythmoot. We can't do it for regional moots, uh, but we're doing it for Mythmoot. So if you, if you, we hope that you can join us uh, for Mythmoot. It is a wonderful time, which I look forward to absolutely every year. Um, but Mootcast uh, is a wonderful experiment that we did last year, and it was a marvelous success. And I am looking forward to uh, uh, to that making that available again this year. And that is, of course, live access to any session that you want to be in remotely, and you get recordings for everything. And um, it uh, it's just a, a wonderful way to be able to to participate and to be able to see what's going on and watch the videos afterwards and things, uh, even if you can't make it. So. Um, Anyhow, um, okay, let's see, James, I think, hmm, well, I've been having some issues lately. Is everybody else seeing the, my, the video okay? It looks like it's going through okay. Might just be you, James, that's possible. Okay, yep, yeah, it looks like everybody else is seeing it, so, all right, very good, very good. Well, we'll see what we can do. Oh, that reminds me, of course. I apologize for the rather abrupt ending <laughs> last week. But uh, it looked like my go-to webinar crashed immediately after I said, well, I think we're going to have to stop there this week. And then, boom, it crashed. And I was like, well, okay. I wasn't planning on stopping exactly when I said that. But, okay, we can, uh, uh, we can, we can run with that, I guess. Okay. Anyhow. Uh, let's uh, let's move forward. So we just got to when uh, Ransom was seeing the Sorns for the first time across the stream, right, and having his um, 
uh, terrifying, uncanny valley experience, right? Seeing the the uh, the enormous, tall, stork-like uh, uh, Sorns. And then the, uh, uh, well, we don't know yet that it's called this, but the Nakra uh, comes down, uh, that large alligator type thing, and uh, enabled him to escape, and he went running off. Um, and that's about as far as we got. So I want to pick up today with his first encounter with uh, Fauna, apart from the Sorns that he sees across the stream. It was impossible to continue yesterday's flight as a flight. Inevitably, it degenerated into an endless ramble, vaguely motivated by the search for food. The search was necessarily vague, since he did not know whether Malacandra held food for him, nor how to recognize it if it did. He had one bad fright in the course of the morning, when, passing through a somewhat more open glade, he became aware first of a huge yellow object, and then two, and then of an indefinite multitude coming towards him. Before he could fly, he found himself in the midst of a herd of enormous pale furry creatures, more like giraffes than anything else he could think of, except that they could and did raise themselves on their hind legs and even progress several paces in that, in that position. They were slenderer and very much higher than giraffes and were eating the leaves off the, top of the tops of the purple plants. They saw him and stared at him with their big liquid eyes, snorting in basso profondissimo, but had apparently no hostile intentions. Their appetite was voracious. In five minutes they had mutilated the tops of a few hundred trees and admitted a new flood of sunlight into the forest. Then they passed on. So this is his first encounter here. Yeah, Curious <laughs> says, Giraffes walking on hind legs is funny. I don't care who you are. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, what do we? What can we learn from this encounter? So, kind of uh, detaching ourselves from the rather strained situation on the sort of landing island or peninsula that they were on. Right? Um, they land the spaceship. And they land the spaceship at the site of uh, Weston and Divine's previous camp, right? There's even a little shed that they built there, right, to store their stuff, which they locked up with a padlock. Um, so that first meeting, when he's still with Weston and Divine, and the Sorns are across the river, it, it's, it's staged really kind of interestingly, right? We have, it is almost like, you know, Earth is on the one side of the river and Malacandra is on the other side of the river, Right. Uh, and, you know, there's this divide between them, the divide of the stream. And there's this move to cross over in between from Weston and Divine. Right. Both of them now carrying Ransom and compelling him by force while he's trying to resist. Right. Because he knows that these are the Sorns and he knows what's meant to happen, that he's meant to be handed over for them uh, as far as Weston and Divine know to be sacrificed. Um, so. That's, those are the circumstances of the very first encounter between Ransom and anything Malacandrian, right? And so I guess say it's kind of hard to, um, you know, that's a, a pretty not objective <laughs> way to, to start off with things, right? Um, and, uh, and it really, it establishes the meetings very much within the framework of Weston and Divine's terms, right? I, even even as I say that sort of the soil that they're on is almost, not quite, but it's almost like it's earth soil, like it's human soil. Um, and they're still seeing, uh, uh, Ransom is still seeing the Sorns from across the, a, a divide there. Here, now that he's on his own and among, you know, the forest and wandering around Malacandre, he is really, in a sense, having his first sort of uh, objective encounters, right? Um, <laughs> what, but what, so in that context, now that he's on his own, right now that he is free of Western, Western and divine, now that he is encountering the Malacandrian landscape, this is his first encounter, his first solo encounter with Malacandrian fauna, right? What, um, 
what does he what does he mean? Yeah, Jennifer says these giraffe things are not Lovecraftian at all. Yes, that is true. That is true. Very little of Lovecraft about this. By the way, so I did. Some of you saw this conversation. I know on Twitter, um, I did consult uh, Brenton Dickinson as I promised I would do, um, and he is doubts. He doubts that C.S. Lewis knew Lovecraft, and the reason that he doubts it, he uh, agrees that. He was doing some reading in some of the right American journals at the right time that it's very plausible that he could have seen it. But he confirmed what I suspected was true, that there is no actual reference. Like C.S. Lewis never refers to him by name or makes any uh, makes any unquestionable reference to one of Lovecraft's stories. And uh, uh, Dr. Dickinson's argument was essentially he finds it hard to believe that if Lewis had read any Lovecraft, he wouldn't have said it, even in his letters, like to nobody. Um, it, it just, it it struck uh, it struck Dr. Dickinson as something that he, what well, he would have said something to somebody about it had he read it. So he is inclined to take the lack of direct reference in the whole C.S. Lewis corpus as uh, probable evidence that he hadn't actually read Lovecraft. So, which, and that, you know, that seems, that seems fair to me. Uh, it's really tempting to think that he must have done. Um, but, uh, but I can, but I can agree that, 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 again, that, that, that reasoning seems sound to me. Um, so exactly, David, I think at the very least we can read it that way, David, as perhaps Lewis reacting more to the general type of science fiction of which Lovecraft is a part, uh, more than Lovecraft himself. Yes. In fact, David, you could almost say that passage that inspired our contemplations about Lovecraft and Lewis, um, that is, remember his, um, his expectations that alien beings are going to be, you know, mandibled in tentacular horrors with superhuman intelligence and subhuman cruelty and all that kind of thing. Um, anyway, that sentence, David, I think, is actually almost strengthened rather than weakened by the lack of direct influence from Lovecraft, right? If, if Lewis is attributing that kind of attitude to the contemporary mindset, right, of which Ransom is a part, even though he holds himself separate in some ways from, you know, from sort of the the mainstream culture of his time. Uh, yet, nevertheless, he still is a, is a product of it. He's still a child of it. Um, and if not even having read Lovecraft, <laughs> he's having these thoughts, you know, yeah, I think there's uh, there's definitely something there. Um, but uh, anyway, OK, um, Here's one thing that I think we can conclude fairly readily about this. Notice how the giraffe beasts react to him. They don't, right? They he finds himself in the midst of the, like they 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 come wandering down towards him. They clearly see him, right? He talks about them staring at him with their big liquid eyes. Right. So it's not merely that he's so short and stumpy that they don't notice him down by their ankles. Right. They see him. They see him. They surround him. They ignore him and they move on. Right. Um, It is. Therefore, I think. uh, Fairly. Clear. That. They're not afraid Right. These are clearly not creatures that are routinely preyed upon or hunted by anything even vaguely resembling Ransom. In fact, even if even Ransom's strangeness, right, because at the very least uh, he's going to appear unusual, right, to these Martian creatures, um, he's... uh, he is, he gets no reaction at all, right? Um, yeah, Coet says humans look harmless to aliens. Yeah, of course, in part, of course, I'm reflecting back on the passage, that the, 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 the Lovecraft issue passage that we just, uh, that I was just referring to about Ransom's expectations about aliens on an alien world. Um, the, these beasts 
have no associations, right? Um, I mean, you know, there are places in the in on Earth that you can go where a herd of wild animals will just wander around you and barely even pay attention to you like this, but it's uncommon. It's fairly uncommon, right? The lack of skittishness in these wild creatures, the total lack of fear or even of interest that these, uh, that these beasts seem to show towards him uh, is, uh, seems to me suggestive, right? Um, it is possible, David, that they're not prey animals at all. Um, uh, I mean, again, their, their lack of being spooked by un- unfamiliar things in their environment might suggest that. Though, of course, everything else in their behavior and description makes them sound like, you know, uh, uh, herbivorous herd animals, right? Um, who could well be hunted. Um, and, of course, especially given the context of the beginning of this paragraph, right, where he is uh, uh, on an endless ramble, vaguely motivated by the search for food, he's got to be thinking it, right? <laughs> Can I bring one of these things down and cook it? Right? Uh, I mean, he's really hungry, and he has no idea how he can get food. Um, now, you know, he's got really no mechanism for that, and Ransom doesn't seem like the sort of chap to try to rig something, you know, to rig up a spear and try to take down one of these things. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, Brian, I agree. It does suggest that these creatures, it's it's possible that they could just simply have nothing to fear because, you know, they're uh, they're not huntable uh, for some reason. But it seems to me more likely to suggest that that kind of thing doesn't happen here. Um, that these look like creatures that have never been hunted, certainly not hunted by people before. And so this seems to be the first hint, the first clue that we have that things work differently. And Jennifer, you're right. It's obvious that predators do exist, right? We did see the alligator thing in the river, right? So we know that there are things with large chomping jaws and big carnivorous teeth um, uh, here on Malacandra. Um, And uh, these are not more examples of the same, just as clearly, right? Um, But uh, anyway... But then he uh, has the big meeting. There was no sound of pursuit. Of course, remember, he's just run off because after this herd of yellow giraffe creatures, uh, there was uh, a Sorn coming along behind, right, who almost saw him and he ran off. That, again, to me, kind of highlights the contrast, right? The fact that Ransom sees a Sorn in the distance and goes herring off in the other direction like he's a prey animal, right? Uh, Understandably. There was no sound of pursuit. Ransom dropped down on his stomach and drank, cursing a world where cold water appeared to be unobtainable. Then he lay still to listen and to recover his breath. His eyes were upon the blue water. It was agitated. Circles shuddered and bubbles danced ten yards away from his face. Suddenly, the water heaved, and a round, shining, black thing like a cannonball came into sight. Then he saw eyes and a mouth, a puffing mouth bearded with bubbles. More of the thing came up out of the water. It was gleaming black. Finally, it splashed and wallowed to the shore and rose, steaming on its hind legs, six or seven feet high and too thin for its height, like everything in Malacandra. It had a coat of thick black hair, lucid as sealskin, very short legs with webbed feet, a broad beaver-like or fish-like tail, strong forelimbs with webbed claws or fingers, and some complication halfway up the belly, which Ransom took to be its genitals. It was something like a penguin, something like an otter, something like a seal. The slenderness and flexibility of the body suggested a giant stoat. The great round head, heavily whiskered, was mainly responsible for the suggestion of seal, but it was higher in the forehead than a seal's, and the mouth was smaller. Okay, so here is his first encounter with Ahras, of course. This is Hyoi, whose name we will learn later on. What 
does Lewis show us here? I really like how this encounter is handled uh, by Lewis. There are a lot of things happening in his encounter with Malachandrians, which... Uh, as I think I've said before, you know, Lewis's vice as an as a as as a fiction writer tends to be to overexplain. But I think this is a passage actually that he handles very delicately. We get this whole thing described in careful step by step detail by Ransom, right? And that, of course, itself evokes Ransom's point of view. Right. And his sort of emotional state at the time, he's just been running from the sword. He's thrown himself down in his belly to take a drink from the river uh, when he gets to the river. Right. And uh, because he's just been running from the sword. Right. And he uh, uh, and then he sees this head coming up out and you get this sense of like how how he's you can tell how he's staring at it. Right. And his uncertainty and uneasiness as he sees the whole body of this black seal-like, stoat-like, otter-like, penguin-like thing, um, you know, slowly emerging from the water and then coming up onto the shore. Um, and the, the sort of step-by-step description of, 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 you know, as he's looking over it and everything and wondering what it is and his careful scrutiny of things like its head. And you can tell many of the things that he's thinking, though he doesn't say them explicitly, right? Things like, is this thing a predator? Is it likely to be trying to eat me? Right? What's, what's, uh, uh, what's, what's going on here? But it's not only that, right? We also, I think, get, especially in retrospect, we don't know at first, we don't really have any reason to suspect that this is a rational creature that he's meeting. But of course, in retrospect, after we know that, it becomes very interesting. Indeed, it becomes very difficult to resist, I find. Imagining this from Hyoi's point of view, right? Um, this is a completely one-sided description. Um, he, the, the narrator is very close to, to first person there, right? He's sort of looking right alongside Ransom as Ransom is staring out. Uh, into uh, uh, into the river and at the cross as it comes up out of the water and the the sort of you know the the narrator's attention sort of the narrator's camera right never really turns around onto Ransom himself as he's as he's watching he leaves it instead to us to imagine um, what the other creature might be thinking right um, and. Uh, Yes, I uh, I agree, Jennifer um, uh, Ewing, that one of the interesting points here is that all of his descriptions uh, are Earth-based, of course, right? I mean, as naturally they would be, right? But the way in which we can see him trying to grapple with what these things are, with what, what this thing is, just by coming up with comparisons, right? I mean, that comparison sentence is not super helpful, Right? It was something like a penguin, something like an otter, something like a seal. By the way, I um, uh, I would I would bet a hundred bucks that I know the sentence C.S. Lewis had in his mind uh, when he wrote that sentence. Um, I think that he's deliberately imitating the syntax of another famous sentence in a scene that I know that he liked very much. And that is Humpty Dumpty's description from Humpty Dumpty's um, exegesis of the Jabberwocky poem uh, in Through the Looking Glass, when he's describing, uh, when he's explaining what a slithy tove is, right? Uh, and he's explaining a tove, and let's see, we'll see if I can remember it, if I can do it from memory. He says there, there's something like, there's something like weasels, and there's something like corkscrews, and there's something like, uh, uh, oh, I'm forget. And also, they live under sundials. Also, they live on cheese. Um, but um, the kind of pairing together, uh, and of course, Humpty Dumpty's description is famously unhelpful, right? I mean, his description of a tove is very, very difficult uh, to uh, 
uh, to to picture. Uh, Alice's response, of course, her next line is, uh, they must be very queer creatures <laughs> indeed, right? Uh, thinking about combining all of these different uh, elements, right? Um, but uh, but anyway, Jennifer, I think you're absolutely right. One of the one of the things that we get here is we can see how fixated Ransom is. Again, very understandably, I'm not criticizing him for it, but we can see how fixated he is on earthly standards, right? He's trying to place it based on his earthly experience. It's something like a penguin, something like an otter, something like a seal, something like a giant stoat. Okay, so where does that leave us, right? So what do you know about it? Answer, almost nothing, because it's not a, none of those things, right? Um, uh, and uh, he has, um, and then even the seal business, right? Okay, so it's, you said it was something like a seal. H- how is it like a seal? Well, mostly the head makes you think of a seal. But it was higher in the forehead, and the mouth was smaller. So, okay, so it's, it's just like a seal, except different, uh, I mean, again, you see, like these, 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 these things aren't helping, right? He is encountering here something different. And Devora, you're absolutely right to emphasize the. Notice his terror is very different, right? He's not horrified like he was when he saw the Sorns, right? The Sorns were enough like humans to make him appalled, right? He had his uncanny valley experience, uh, and he really. Uh, disliked the experience of uh, encountering the Sorns. Um, here he's curious, clearly a little bit worried, wondering if he's going to be attacked or if the thing is going to try to eat him. Um, but again, he is being tied up with these earthly uh, earthly standards. The, the truth of the matter never occurs to him, right? Forget the earthly animals that it kind of makes you think of. Right. Um, If instead he were able to look at it objectively, right, to sort of, uh, you know, in the Sorns, he met similarities to humans, external similarities, and he was alarmed and disturbed. Here he meets difference. Doesn't look anything like a person. Right. Looks kind of like a bunch of different animals all put together. And yet he's going to find that it's much more similar than it looks. Right. Looking at it and trying to fit it into earthly categories does not enable him to um, perceive at all that this thing might be rational. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Good. Exactly. Brian, I agree that he thinks he's able uh, reliably to classify this animal, uh, this as animal and not human. Right. He's not even asking the question. Right. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Then something happened which completely altered his state of mind. The creature, which was still steaming and shaking itself on the bank and had obviously not seen him, opened its mouth and began to make noises. This in itself was not remarkable, but a lifetime of linguistic study assured Ransom almost at once that these were articulate noises. The creature was talking. It had language. If you are not yourself a philologist, I am afraid you must take on trust the prodigious emotional consequences of this realization in Ransom's mind. A new world he had already seen, but a new, an extraterrestrial, a non-human language was a different matter. Somehow he had not thought of this in connection with the Sorns. Now it flashed upon him like a revelation. The love of knowledge is a kind of madness. In the fraction of a sentence, which it, in the fraction of a second, which it took Ransom to decide that the creature was really talking, and while he still knew that he might be facing instant death, his imagination had leaped over every fear and hope and probability of his situation to follow the dazzling project of making a Malacandrian grammar. An introduction to the Malacandrian language, the lunar verb, a concise Martian English dictionary, The titles flitted through his mind. And what might one not discover from the speech of a non-human race? The very form of language itself, the principle behind all possible languages, might fall into his hands. 
Unconsciously, he raised himself on his elbow and stared at the black beast. It became silent. The huge bullet head swung round, and lustrous amber eyes fixed him. There was no wind on the lake or in the wood. Minute after minute, in utter silence, the representatives of two so far divided species stared each other into stared into each other's face. Okay. Um Yeah. Curita, I agree. The love of knowledge is a kind of madness is a great line. Um <laughs> David Atley says, There are words in that cry, though he couldn't catch them. Yeah, exactly. Um uh, <laughs> yeah, Takako, I also wonder how Tolkien reacted uh, at this part. I have to think that Tolkien laughed uh, at this uh, at this bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, and Devora, I agree. I really like the advancing and retreating from either one of them, right? As neither one of them is wanting to get near enough to let the other touch, but neither one of them is wanting to uh, to run away and lose the opportunity. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, no, so, David, he still doesn't know whether he's on Mars. So those are his two leading guesses, right? His two leading guesses are that he's either on the moon or he's on Mars. So that's why he says his, his theoretical book titles, right? It could be the lunar verb. It could be a concise Martian English dictionary. He's kind of leaving uh, leaving that open because he doesn't know yet. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, James was asking about the same thing. Karita, and I agree. I think the, 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 the most comical bit is if you are not yourself a philologist, <laughs> as if that's going to be a significant percentage of his audience. And that's, of course, the joke, right? Um yeah, yeah. So here we have Ransom's motivation. Now, the, 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 his motivation now for changing his perspective, right? For making contact um, with, uh, for making contact with this representative of 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 a of a strange race for the first time. Um, the first thing I want to do here is contrast it with Weston and Divine, right? We were looking last time at how Weston and Divine are, you know, not meant to be well-rounded characters. They, uh, they, they represent two different ideas, right? Two different earthly, sort of modern earthly perspectives on modernity, right? On the modern world. Um, and Ransom is a third and we see that very clearly here uh in this encounter right weston doesn't really care about other species right or if he does it's only as a means to an end right divine suggests that he might keep one in order to vivisect it or something right or have sex with it or you know whatever keep it as a pet right but all three of those things, as uh, uh, I forget who it was who was pointing this out, you know, the, uh, you know, rape, torture and slavery in one sentence, right? Casually thrown out as a joke by by divine. Um, but of course, all three of those projects, right, rape, torture and slavery are all about the radical subjecting of the will and the good of someone else to your own desires, right, to your own uh, to your own intentions, um, the absolute disregard of their personhood, right? Um, of their, I, don't, I won't even say rights, right? I don't, let's just stick with personhood. Um, and again, that's in a sense that's coming from both Weston and Divine, right? We can see in Weston that kind of disregard uh, for, he has less utter disregard for people than Divine does, right? Divine doesn't care at all. Um, but, um, uh, but here with Ransom, we can see a totally different attitude and it's his love of learning, right? It's his love of language that first over helps him to overcome his fear and immediately be drawn with desire towards this meeting with this strange creature. Um, that last sentence, minute after minute, in utter silence, the representatives of two so far divided species stared each other, stared 
into the other's face. He is looking into the face of another species. And it seems in a very, you know, in a very real way, neither Western nor Divine has ever done that, right? They were, I mean, they kind of, they know that the Sorens are a different species, but they don't exactly care, right? Um, they certainly have never had, you know, it does not seem they ever had this sense of, um, this sense of encounter, right? Exactly, Zach. I, I, I think that's the point, right? That the scientist, the capitalist, and the philologist are the three types of humans, right? Everybody, all human beings can basically be put into one of those three categories. I agree. It seems fairly inclusive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree, Stephen. That's exactly right. Weston's interest in the in in these other species uh, is only the way in which he would be interested in a lesser animal, like if he discovered a new species of, you know, wombat or something. Um, you know, he might want to you know classify it and 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 learn something perhaps uh, about it or from studying it. Um, but what he's certainly not going to do is to be staring. Um, staring eye to eye, right? Uh, like they are meeting on equal terms like this. Um, yeah, yeah. Good, yes, Colette, that's a really good point too. Colette points out that another thing that we see about Ransom here is that the book titles imply that his immediate thought is to come home and teach other humans to speak with these beings. Exactly. He, he Now, you could say, Coet, that his desire for knowledge here is, in one way of looking at it, not totally different from Weston's, right? That is, if what he wants is to learn the language of these creatures so that he can go back to Earth and publish books about the language, not in order to facilitate communication, but to, to make himself famous or because... For the sake of science, right? The science of philology in this case. Um, think about how much could be learned about language, right? The, there's that one brief moment, uh, that, 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 that sentence about uh, uh, what might one not discover from the speech of a non-human race, the very form of language itself, the principle behind all possible languages might fall into his hands. That right there is the shadow of a motivation that if he and Weston were in a different, were swapped, right? That's, that's in a, that would justify Weston in acting in almost any way towards these creatures, right? If now Weston, of course, thinks that philology and other such unscientific subjects are mere trash, right? So he obviously wouldn't care about this exactly. But again, if Ransom shared towards his own discipline, his own field of study, uh, Weston's attitude towards learning in general, you can see that Ransom has here a motivation which is not a wholly excellent motivation, right? Um, potentially, potentially, it could be turned around into a means and ends issue for Ransom, right? But I don't think that's where he is, right? We can see the temptation, but the fact that although, you know, that that's his very first thought, right, his first imaginative fancies are towards the books that he could publish uh, um, uh, in uh, uh, in in his own world. Right. Uh, he would be the famousest of the of philologists. And that is saying a lot, Matthew. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, right, David, exactly. I, I do agree that there's, there's, there, there is, well, let me just stick with the potential in Ransom's half of this encounter. There is the potential that his interaction with this creature might not be benevolent, right? Or could become, well, I don't want to go straight to malevolent, but non-benevolent or less benevolent, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Stephen wonders how much of that is the influence of having spent the entire journey with Weston and Divine. True enough, though, of course, again, as we've seen and been reminded of at several other on several other occasions, um, 
it's also a product of having just grown up in the same society that produced Weston and Divine, right? I mean, he is uh, uh, he is still a child of his generation. Okay. However, uh, things go fairly well, right? Um So the, 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 the Hross leads him back to the water, right? It has picked up this shell, like an oyster shell, like a large oyster shell. It took him only as far as where it had got the shell. And here, to his not very reasonable astonishment, Ransom found that a kind of boat was moored. Manlike, when he saw the artifact, he felt more certain of the Hross's rationality. He even valued the creature the more because the boat, allowing for the usual Malachandrian height and flimsiness, was really very like an earthly boat. Only later did he set himself the question, what else could a boat be like? The Hross produced an oval platter of some tough but slightly flexible material, covered it with strips of a spongy, orange-colored substance, and gave it to Ransom. He cut a convenient length off with his knife and began to eat, doubtfully at first, and then ravenously. It had a bean-like taste, but sweeter, good enough for a starving man. Then as his hunger ebbed, the sense of his situation returned with dismaying force. The huge, seal-like creature seated beside him became unbearably ominous. It seemed friendly, but it was very big, very black, and he knew nothing at all about it. What were its relations to the Sorens? And, what, and was it really as rational as it appeared? It was only many days later that Ransom discovered how to deal with these sudden losses of confidence. They arose when the rationality of the Hross tempted you to think of it as a man. Then it became abominable, a man seven feet high with a snaky body covered face and all with that with thick black animal hair and whiskered like a cat. But, starting from the other end, you had an animal with everything an animal ought to have, glossy coat, liquid eye, sweet breath, and whitest teeth, and added to all these, as though paradise had not been lost and earliest dreams were true, the charm of speech and reason. Nothing could be more disgusting than the one impression, nothing more delightful than the other. It all depended on the point of view. Here we can see that initial experience that Ransom had with the Sorens suddenly, you know, re-examined now. We, we begin to see his perspective shifting around, right? Um, the problem with the Sorens is that they were like humans, but not quite like humans, right? Um, the Hross is different. So again, you see, notice the, um, notice the difference, the difference between the two different points of view, the two different uh, reactions to the Hross. It depends on where you start, right? It depends on where you start. Exactly, Devora. Valuing something for what it is and not what you think it should be. Exactly. If you say to yourself, this is essentially a human, right? But a, a hideously different human right? A bestial human. That is disgusting, right? It's appalling. But if instead you don't start from your own point of view, don't start with yourself as the standard, right? If you begin instead to accept difference, this creature is very different from me, right? It is shaped differently. It has a different pelt and a different color. And, uh, you know, all things about it are different. And yet, granted that we have these differences, we also, like, can speak together. And, and, and we both reason alike, right? If you come at it from that perspective, it's delightful. Absolutely delightful. But if you f instead start in taking essentially yourself as the standard. I am no, I am what is normal, right? Um, I am how rational creatures should be like. Therefore, any rational creature which is unlike me is abominable. 
And again, that is a slightly more Weston and divine like attitude, right? Um, think about Weston and his, um, uh, you know, adherence to the future of humanity, right? Um, his patriotic support of his own species up against any other, right? And how uh, that, you know, the idea of the, obviously the natives of Malacandria are going to have to be destroyed, right? To make room and to make sure there's no competition with the humans. Yeah. Kit, I, I, I think he does want to feel superior. I Yes. You mean in relationship to the animal? I don't know. The reference to paradise never being lost, right? Part of the concept of Eve before, you know, of Adam and Eve before the fall, right? Of Eden before the fall is what I was starting to say. Um, is that there, it's true that even in Eden, as it's depicted in the Bible, uh, uh, you know, the beasts are still subject to man even before the fall, even within Eden. Um, but what he's suggesting there, it seems to me, added to all these as though paradise had never been lost, the charm of speech and reason. So notice he's 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 adding it right. Um, this is it's just like an animal, right? But it's much more than an animal. Um, I think I mean, you definitely could say that looking at it that way makes him feel superior. But again, that seems to me, in fact, to contradict the other half of it, right? Again, when he's, it's when he ceases to take himself of, as the standard of normality, which he was already doing in a sense um, in, uh, with his terrestrial animal comparisons, his seal, penguin, stoat thing, right? Um I'm going to take, you know, my, you know, our earth animals and my earth categories as like the way, you know, rather than just observing and trying to figure out how does this thing, you know, act and what is it really about? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, David, I agree that there's still... A in a sense, a question about that. So David Atley is saying the shift in perspective is useful, but it could also tempt one to assume that the Hross is different enough that it isn't entitled to what we'd call human rights. I agree that that temptation would exist, right? We can see Weston and Divine having it. And remember, we were listening to Divine's half of that conversation, and um, we could tell that some of the things that Weston were, was saying were some of his protestations about uh, motivate. You'll remember Divine's sarcastic crack that, oh, of course, it's understood that you're doing all these things for the for the highest motives, right? That is to say, Divine doesn't care. Like, he'll slaughter all the natives and he doesn't care who they are and what they are. They're his competition. He can profit by their death, and so he's ready to kill them. It, does, it, it, it doesn't matter to him at all, right? He has exactly the attitude of, you know, an 18th century slaver in Africa, Right. It's it's um, he doesn't care at all. However, um, Weston does care a little bit. Right. Just as although he believes that, you know, what they're doing is really important. And so therefore, uh, obviously, the rights of uh, of ransom must be sacrificed for the higher cause. But he does acknowledge that ransom kind of does have rights. Right. Um, so does Ransom ha or sorry, does Weston have qu qualms about the natives, about the fact that they're clearly rational species um, and at least asking the question, David, of whether they're entitled to some kind of rights right now? Granted that he's totally comfortable at, well, at least almost entirely comfortable abrogating the rights of Ransom, who is clearly a human. Right. Uh, for his greater good, you know, for Weston's greater good, I mean. There's no question that he would sacrifice uh, uh, the local Malacandrians uh, for the greater good at least as easily uh, and, and, and almost certainly more so. But he does at least seem to ask the question. 
And I suspect that that's what Divine is getting at when Divine comes back and jibes at him about saving him some. Right. Um, or, you know, or, you know, when he says, if you, you know, if you uh, if you love them that much, you know, you can you should stay and interbreed. Remember when he, he's making that crack? And I assume that what he's responding to there is Weston expressing some uncertainty. You know, if these are rational creatures, then, you know, what what are their rights and whatever else? Um, so anyway, um, uh, yeah, so I. Uh, that that question is there. Weston seems divine isn't concerned with it at all. Weston seems at least to be asking it. Um, Ransom is clearly much more open minded about it. Um, he does think himself superior, I think. But I, I want to be careful with this because again, the the primary emphasis here is on his shifting of perspective and of his meeting the Hross desiring to learn from the Hross and um, uh, uh, realizing that this is another, a sort of a fellow rational species, right? We will see his own assumptions creeping up again and again, but that Ransom, uh, but I think that to, to read this passage is merely saying that Ransom still comforted himself by the fact that he uh, was superior, right? Uh, they're still mostly animal and only a little bit rational. And when he thought about it that way, he felt better, right? I think that that's a very serious misreading uh, of this passage. I'm not saying that there is no element of that. Again, we will see Ransom's sense of, or his presumptions about human superiority in various ways uh, creeping up. Uh, at various points, um, but I, 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 I absolutely, um, I absolutely deny the idea that that's the that's the core of what's motivating him here. Um, having got into the boat, uh, that is, uh, the Ross right gets into the boat and gets out again. He proceeded to get out again and then pointed to it. Ransom understood that he was being invited to follow his example. The question which he wanted to ask above all others could not, of course, be put. Were the Hrossa, he discovered later that this was the plural of Hross, the dominant species on Malacandra, and the Sorns, despite their more manlike shape, merely a semi-intelligent kind of cattle? Fervently, he hoped that it might be so. On the other hand, the Hrossa might be the domestic animals of the Sorns, in which case the latter would be super-intelligent. His whole imaginative training somehow encouraged him to associate superhuman intelligence with monstrosity of form and ruthlessness of will. So, okay, so that's two, checking two out of the three boxes for the Sorns, right? Monstrosity of form he's already seen. If they've got superhuman intelligence, this is looking bad, right? Um, uh, surely their will must be ruthless. To step on board the Hross's boat might mean surrendering himself to Sorns at the other end of the journey. On the other hand, the Hross's invitation might be a golden opportunity of leaving the Sorn haunted forests forever, and by this time the Hross itself was becoming puzzled at his apparent inability to understand it. The urgency of its signs finally determined him. The thought of parting from the Hross could not be seriously entertained. Its animality shocked him in a dozen ways, but his longing to learn its language, and deeper still, the shy, ineluctable fascination of unlike for unlike, the sense that the key to prodigious adventure was being put in his hands. All this had really attached him to it by bonds stronger than he knew. He stepped into the boat. Okay. See those assumptions that we were talking about right away? Right? Um, listen to the assumptions that underlie this sentence. Were the Hrasa... The dominant species on Malacandra and the Sorns, despite their more man-like shape, merely a semi-intelligent kind of cattle? Despite their more man-like shape, right? Now, notice that he is aware of the assumption, right? He is aware of the fact that he is, he's questioning the assumption, right? His initial is, uh, assumption is the Sorns look more like men, and the Hrossa look more like animals. So, you know, on the surface, it looks like the Sorns have to be the dominant race, and the Hrossa might even just be domesticated animals of the Sorns, right? Um, 
that um but again he makes that assumption right those terms are very much in his head and even uh uh even if it's if it's upside down right um and the men like shaped sorns are only a semi-intelligent kind of cattle and the hrasa are dominant he has that feeling that that would be the natural order inverted right but again he's asking the question right he is acknowledging the fact that he has those assumptions right that he makes those um that he makes those um uh connections right and he's not really sure um Nancy says his reasoning here is very strange and imperialistic. Well, yes and no. Um, you you are, of course, Nancy, exactly spotting the even deeper assumption that he's not questioning at all, right? And that assumption is pretty clear, right? If there are two rational species on Malacandra, obviously... One of them has to rule the other. I mean, that's inevitable. The only question is which one rules and which one serves. If there are two rational races, one must be a master race and the other a servant race. Stephen, exactly. That is his baseline assumption that he makes here. And let's face it. From a terrestrial standpoint, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. Um, that's, you know, a fairly reasonable assumption. Um, and I, I, I hear you, Nancy, when you're thinking, when you're comparing that to imperialism. And of course, in 1930s, he's much, much closer to the imperial era uh, and the whole imperial mindset than we are now. But this is not just about imperialism, right? I mean, this has kind of always been the case. Um, uh, and you can, you can, I mean, goodness, I, I remember, you know, the thing that makes me think of Nancy is when I was, um, uh, when my wife and I visited Hawaii, uh, back in October, which was delightful. And we were just, we were both reading about Hawaiian history and, uh, and just, you know, I mean, like, okay, so you've got, like, several different tribes on, like, the two different islands, right? You know, so you've got, like, the, this one tribe which is dominant on this, on the one island, and this other tribe which is dominant on the other. And the only question is, like, sooner or later, like, who, which island is going to conquer the other one, right? And who's going to end up serving and who's going to end up being the master? And that had nothing to do with European imperialism, right? That was long before uh, the Europeans came. Um that's again, that's it's it's uh, it kind of does seem to be a human thing and not just a, not just a uh, like a European imperialist thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. David says Homo sapiens is the only species in our genus for a good reason. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, we we made sure of that it kinda, it rather seems. Um yeah, yeah. Jennifer, good. I, I also really love here. Again, it, it's, it is a really fun, and I love the fact that Lewis leaves this completely open, right? He doesn't tell us exactly what's going on there, which is, again, kind of unlike Lewis. It would be really fun to rewrite these, this whole encounter from Hyoi's point of view, right? Because um, you're right, Jennifer, he's, he's probably thinking, Hyoi is probably thinking something like, um, you know, this thing doesn't look much like me and he can't understand simple directions like getting into, I don't know how I can make this any clear. You get into the boat in order to come with me, right? Um, I mean, uh, that, you know, ironically, uh, Ransom is using the phrase semi-intelligent, right? And uh, I wonder, right? I wonder if uh, that, <laughs> you know, concept is crossing Hyoi's mind here. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Um yeah, yeah, good. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, Nancy, I can understand the skepticism that it always happens or that it always happens in this way. 
But what does seem fairly safe to say is that it does happen a lot and it had been happening for a lot uh, before, you know, any of the great empires, whether you're thinking of ancient empires or modern empires. Um, as Brian says, the impulse for the human impulse for war uh, doesn't depend on the power to rule an empire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but look what motivates his decision, right? He's worried. And his worries are ultimately selfish, right? If it turns out that the Haras are ruled by the Sorns and he takes me home and home is like the manner of his Sorn master, right? Then I'm host, right? I mean, that's, that's the end, right? Um, but uh, maybe it will help me escape, right? Still thinking selfishly. But n notice at the end, right? Um, his longing to learn its language, the shy, ineluctable fascination of like for unlike, the sense that the key to prodigious adventure was being put in his hands. All this had really attached him to it by bonds stronger than he knew. The things that impel it, it's not fear. It's not desire. It's not the selfish motivations, ultimately, that lead him to make the call. Right. He is drawn to the cross, not because he's the same, not just because he's different. Right. But because of um, his longing to learn. Right. To interact with it, to learn its language. His fascination with the the idea. Right. That there's this rational species, which, you know, it looks like an animal, but it has reason. Like, I really I, 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 I'm fascinated by this. I need to know more. I want to know more. And that vaguer sense that the key to prodigious adventure was being put in his hands. Um, yeah, that is like his took side coming out, Colette. I agree. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Devorah, I agree. Kresachlab uh, uh, does kind of make me think of Lapine a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Carrie says he's a cultural anthropologist as well as a linguist. Uh, this is irresistible uh, to us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, and Car Carita, yes, I agree. The longing to learn the language is also a little selfish, right? Not necessarily in the vainglorious way, like, but think of my career, right? That's, you know, there, there, I, there, there were tinges of that clearly in his um, publication dreams right away. But um, uh, but it's clear that that's not his main his main motivation. Um, yeah, <laughs> David, I agree. The Ross is clearly wondering if this new creature is 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 is, you know, dumb, deaf or what. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. OK. All this time, they were descending beside the rapids to where the water was level again, and the Hross could relaunch its skiff. During this walk, Ransom learned the words for boat, rapid, water, sun, and carry. The latter, as his first verb, interested him particularly. The Hross was also at some pains to impress upon him an association or relation which it tried to convey by repeating the contrasted pairs of words, Hrossa, Hrondramit, Hondramit, and Serone. Harandra. Ransom understood him to mean that the Hrasa lived down in the Handramet and the Serone up on the Harandra. What the deuce were Serone, he wondered. The open reaches of the Harandra did not look as if anything lived up there. Perhaps the Hrasa had a mythology. He took it for granted that they were on a low cultural level, and the Serone were gods or demons. The journey continued, with frequent though decreasing recurrences of nausea for Ransom. Hours later, he realized that Serony might very well be the plural of Sorn. Yeah, exactly, Arthur. It does seem to take him a while to think of that, right? You know, Arthur says, w would the philologist not think that uh, Serony are the plural of Sorn? Um, yeah, exactly. But again, Arthur, I think that's the point, right? Um, there is something... Well, I don't want to go quite so far as shameful, but revealing about the fact that it took him hours to have that thought, right? 
um, he, um, he's kept from that quite logical linguistic thought um, by his assumptions again, right? What, it, what he is taking for granted, that they are on a low cultural level. So he's expecting some kind of uneducated mythology from them, right? So when he hears them talking about the Sereni, and especially pointing up to the highlands where it doesn't look like anything can live, right? So Ransom, who obviously knows more than the Hross, right, looks up there and he's like, yeah, no, things don't really live up there. That's obvious, right? And so therefore, since he says the Sereni live up there, then this must be a like, OK, you know, the gods live up in the sky palace kind of situation. Most likely a mumbo jumbo de- devora. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but of course, if we actually listen to what the Hross is saying, the Hross doesn't imply anything like that. One hundred percent of this like you know, God, demon, uh, mythology thing. It's all ransom, right? What the Hross is saying very clearly, he's saying, you know, there are these two parts of the world, right? These, there are these two, uh, you know, different geological areas of Malacandria. There's the Handramit and there's the Harandra. The Hross, the Hrossa, live down here in the Handramit, and the Sereni live up on the Harandra. Notice Ransom gets that. Like, it's not that he fails to understand that. He gets that. But then he feels like the need to see through it, right? To interpret it, to get to the probe to the real meaning of it. When in fact, what the Hross is saying is we're, we both live in different places, right? There's no hint of dominance, of superstition, of you know, ignorant veneration. There's no hint of that in what the Hross is actually saying. That is all projected by Ransom based on his assumptions. Yes, uh, Kit, absolutely. We see here again him making the same assumptions that Weston makes. And Kit, I absolutely agree with you. The number one difference um, is that Ransom learns Right. And Weston doesn't. Now, you can say the reason why Ransom learns and Weston doesn't is because of an even deeper difference between the two of them and their different outlooks. Right. But again, it is certainly true that Ransom shares many of the uh, many of the points of view, many of the, the, the assumptions, even though he feels himself divided from Weston by a very great cultural divide. Right. Um, even about vivisection. You remember that debate? that discussion. Um, anyway, he, he and Weston are clearly a very different, you know, ideological parties down on earth. And yet when they're up here, we can, we can see they both leap to the same, um, the same assumption. Um, yeah, yeah. Nancy, I agree. That also seems to be potentially a kind of, uh, gentle barb that Lewis is placing here, right? Um, Nancy's pointing out the the facile association between having a mythology and being on a low cultural level, right? Um, that Ransom makes here. Um, as Nancy points out, if you want an inherently human thing, mythology is it, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, having a mythology does not at all prove that you're on a low cultural level necessarily. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think that that's, uh, uh, that that's, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I wonder, Steven says, I wonder if, uh, it's trying to explain the location words so that Ransom can say where he lives, right? Hwasa Handramit, Sereni Harandra, Khmana, where right and 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 so what's happening with ransom while ransom is thinking all of these like ah mm, i am penetrating to the heart of the cultural factors here involved in the he's like missing the point right um i like that idea steven that the you know that 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 Hyoi is kind of internally face palming as he's like boy like this 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 creature 
is just not super bright, is it? I mean, this is going to be harder than I had than I had hoped. Yeah. Yeah, good, Brian. You're also right. The assumption uh, that uh, if you believe in gods or demons, uh, that it must be a low cultural mythology. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Jennifer Pope says it's as if Ransom is a lost child that's been found wandering and the Ross is trying to get his address. Right. And and Ransom as the child is not even understanding the question. Right. Yeah, exactly. So this is now after he is in the village with the Hrosa and he's been living with them for a while. And so this is him kind of trying to try and trying to understand them. Right. Still trying to figure them out. They seemed to have no arts except a kind of poetry and music, which was practiced almost every evening by a team or troop of four Hrosa. One recited half chanting at great length, while the other three, sometimes singly and sometimes antiphonally, interrupted him from time to time with song. Ransom could not find out whether these interruptions were simply lyrical interludes or dramatic dialogue arising out of the leader's narrative. He could make nothing of the music. The voices were not disagreeable, and the scale seemed adapted to human ears, but the time pattern was meaningless to his sense of rhythm. The occupations of the tribe or family were at first mysterious. People were always disappearing for a few days and reappearing again. There was a little fishing and much journeying in boats, of which he never discovered the object. Then one day he saw a kind of caravan of Hrosa setting out by land, each with a load of vegetable food on its head. Apparently, there was some kind of trade in Malacandra. Okay. Um, now, Jennifer, that's a really good question. Um, Jennifer uh, Ewing asks, uh, R Ransom learned words... Was the cultural interaction mutual? Was he teaching his language to the Hross? Um, we don't know. Uh, we're not told that. We're not told that he doesn't. I mean, what is emphasized in this story is his progress in learning their language. And of course, on the one hand, he is the one stranger in the midst of their whole culture. So, you know... <laughs> Talk about cultural imperialism, right? If you're like the one guy in the middle of this strange settlement to be like, okay, okay, I know how to handle this. I'm going to teach all of y'all English, right? Let's make the whole village speak English. Then we're th then we'll all be good, right? Um, so obviously, it's uh, it makes a good deal more sense uh, for in that way for him to uh, uh, to focus on learning their language instead of uh, teaching them his. Not to mention the fact that he, of course, as a philologist, is interested to the point of obsession with learning their language. So he is probably much more eager to learn than teach in this instance. However, um, it doesn't explicitly say that uh, uh, that he doesn't do it. And I don't think the idea of him teaching them some words is inconsistent with the story. Um, but the story does emphasize that he's mostly learning their language. Um, Steve and I agree. They're, they don't seem to be interested in his language in itself. They're just interested in communicating with him. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Good. Good. Um, good. Catherine, that's another really good point. Um, he wouldn't have words for a lot of what is there, right? So... You know, there's no point in him trying to teach them the English word for Hundramit, right? There isn't an English word exactly for Hundramit. The word valley surely wouldn't do, right? Um, so, yes, in that way, it makes... That's another reason why it makes a good deal more sense for him to try to learn... Uh, to, for the focus to be on just learning their language rather than trying uh, to teach them English. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, good. So, um, Stephen, I wonder. Uh, it is interesting that he doesn't sing or recite poetry himself. Like that, that, that is, he never tries to demonstrate for them how poetry in English works. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, David, there isn't any clear indication that he contributes 
in any way, like he pitches in and helps with the labor. Again, maybe he does, but that's not really what's emphasized here. One thing to keep in mind, this is, um, this is, uh, a very short book, right? Um, there is a very great deal of detail not gone into in this book. Um, and so a lot of this story being that it is a story which appears to be setting out to tell the story in, in, in a fairly short space, um, could certainly tell us a great deal more than it does, um, but uh, tries to stick to sort of the bigger, the bigger picture issues here. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Karina, you're right. He left his. He must have left his copy of Songs for the Philologists at home. Yeah, that's too bad. That's too bad. They would have liked that. Um, you're right, Devore. He does help to prepare for the for the Hanakra hunt. Absolutely. Um, and participates, of course, in the Hanakra hunt. So it's 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 not obvious that he is holding himself aloof from their work uh, completely. Anyway, his relationship with their art. What conclusions might we draw about cross poetry? from this passage about cross culture you're right Karita he is presume he is apparently helping with cross daycare while he's there and that's certainly a valuable role that he's playing in society Jennifer yes we can clearly conclude that this is an oral culture right this regular almost ritual oriented. I mean, that is like, it's, you know, almost every evening it happens, right? Um, uh, this chanting and singing and recitation, right? This is, uh, this is, uh, this is a big deal, right? Their art is collaborative, Margaret. Yeah. That's a really, really good observation. Um, we never get a depict of a, a single cross, just, you know, spitting, uh, in you know, uh, just 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 reciting right all by himself. Um, that's so. Yes, their art does seem to be intrinsically collaborative, intrinsically interactive, intrinsically communal in that way. And Amber, you're absolutely right. The Hross, the Hrasa are very trusting uh, to let the Haman. Uh, hang out with our kids in the way that he does. Um, just as the yellow giraffe creatures didn't seem to be at all skittish around this strange, literally alien creature suddenly in their midst, um, the neither the Hrasa young nor the Hrasa mothers seem to be the slightest bit concerned about him. Um, there's no evidence at all that they ran even a cursory background check on him before allowing him to participate in daycare. But back to the art. Back to the art. Why can't... Why can't Ransom understand it? Now, part of that, of course, is very simple. His grasp of the language isn't good enough yet, right? Um, and, you know, that's sort of simple enough. The rhythm is alien, John, which is, does seem like a big deal, right? Um, uh, I was immediately uh, thinking of uh, Gregorian monks. Um, I mean, of course, there's the story not sure how true it was, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the leader of the sort of choir of Gregorian mon monks would start with his own pulse, right? He'd start with the pulse of his own heartbeat, and that's the rhythm that they would begin their chant with. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, 
in a singing group I used to be in in college, we used to joke about, you know, the, the day that the monk was late for practice, right? Um, <laughs> came dashing in. Uh, they did the chant in double, uh, double time. Um, but yeah, Nancy, it, he doesn't have the right cultural background, right? But, but here's the, the other thing that I would emphasize. It's, it's very sophisticated, right? Um, notice that even Ransom is aware that it's not a physical inability that gets in his way. The voices are not disagreeable, and the scale seemed adapted to human ears, but the time pattern was meaningless to his sense of rhythm. It's not that he can't hear it. It's not that like it's not pleasing to the human ear, right? It's not like this is like it's like a horrible screeching and caterwauling, which might I guess sound good to other Hrasa, but to humans it's it's not that, right? The voices sound nice. Uh, and he can hear them perfectly well. It's just well, he doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. It goes over his head. The whole thing goes over his head. He does lack the vocabulary, definitely, but it's even the music he doesn't get, right? He can tell that there is stuff going on here, right? But it is beyond his ability to understand. The poetic art of the Hrasa appears to be extremely sophisticated. Extremely sophisticated. Um, remember where we start this paragraph. They seem to have no arts except a kind of poetry, right? Um, so he's still trying to understand their culture, how it works, right? They don't make things like they have very few. They do have artifacts, but they have f comparatively few artifacts. They seem to make no visual art. Um, they, uh, they don't even seem to use all that many tools, right? And they certainly don't appear to have machines. Um, uh, so he's just not in this passage. And it's in a different passage where he diagnoses their culture as old Stone Age, right? Again, low cultural level, these, these, uh, these Hrasa are beginning at. And yet, their poetic performance is not just beyond his language understanding. It is a work of artistic intricacy beyond his ability even to follow, even to appreciate. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and the point is that is in very sharp contrast with the rest of the Ross culture, right? He seems to assume that these things are all going to progress alike, right? Tool usage and machine development, agricultural sophistication, trade, arts, Right. These are all going to be these are all cultural markers that he's expecting to advance in a particular way. And the thing that he notices about the Hrasa is that it doesn't work the way that he expects it to work. In almost every way, they look extremely primitive. Right. Their culture is extremely primitive, except they have this poetry, which is. Incredibly sophisticated, right? More sophisticated than English poetry. More sophisticated, perhaps, than classical poetry. Uh, maybe even as, as sophisticated as modern rap music, though I don't know if it's quite that good. Um, um, but, uh, but yes, Brian, we do also see the assumption that oral culture must be primitive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And John, you're right. We don't know their physiology. They could have two hearts and uh, 12 fingers. We abs that, that absolutely could be true. Um, uh, yeah. 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 So, so again, that, that there are alien standards upon which it's based makes sense. Right. Um, but, uh, but he doesn't know how to figure it out. Right. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Oops, sorry, wrong way. But the real revolution in his understanding of the Hrosa began when he had learned enough of their language to attempt some satisfaction of their curiosity about himself. In answer to their questions, he began by saying that he had come out of the sky. Hnora immediately asked from which planet or Earth, Hundra. Ransom, who had deliberately given a childish version of the truth in order to adapt it to the supposed ignorance of his audience, was a little annoyed to find Hnora painfully explaining to him that he could not live in the sky because there was no air in it. He might have come through the sky, but he must have come from a Hundra. He was quite unable to point Earth out to them in the night sky. They seemed surprised at his inability, and repeatedly pointed out to him a bright planet low on the western horizon, a little south of where the sun had gone down. He was surprised that they selected a planet instead of a mere star, and stuck to their choice. Could it be possible that they understood astronomy? Unfortunately, he still knew too little of the language to explore their knowledge. He turned the conversation by asking them the name of the bright southern planet, and he was told that it was Thulkandra the silent world, or planet. Why call it Thulk, he said. Why silent? No one knew. The Serony know, said, said Hnora. That is the sort of thing they know. Then he was asked how he had come, and made a very poor attempt at describing the spaceship. But again, the Serony would know. <laughs> I love... I, I love the... Uh, their, again, the assumption that he makes about their ignorance, right? I came th from the sky, right? I f I, and, you know, and they're like, actually, you know that that's impossible, right? Their scientific knowledge is way more sophisticated uh, than he possibly imagined, right? Um. And they show immediately a far greater, not just general scientific knowledge, right, um, but um, uh, but astronomy as well. They know the difference between planets and stars, right? They know, they clearly, all of them clearly know more astronomy than Ransom does, um, as he can't even point out Earth in the sky, right? Loser. Um Yes, but Nancy, you are absolutely right. Although the Hrasa are masters of poetry and verbal art, they don't know why certain things are called what they are, right? The level of knowledge of the Hrasa is very surprising to Ransom. Their sort of contentment with their ignorance is also surprising. Right? They don't know why Tholkandra is called Tholkandra, the silent planet. Right? That is the sort of thing they know. That's the sort of thing that Sereni know. Right? Clearly. We don't know that. And apparently don't care. Right? Um, kind of uh, makes me feel... Uh, it, Reminds me of uh, Sherlock Holmes and the uh, the Copernican solar system, right? Um, that they don't need to know this, right? They clearly have had some kind of they have some kind of instruction, or how do they know the science that they know? How do they know that there's no air up in the up you know far up in the sky? How do they know that there are other, you know, the difference between planets and stars? How do they know that these other planets might be inhabited? And that if they're meeting an alien, it certainly came from another Hondra? Um, all of these things are things that it's very surprising that they knew. One would think that the only thing that would lead to such knowledge would be scientific curiosity. And yet, as soon as he probes it, he finds an utter lack of scientific curiosity. Why do you call it folk? Eh, I don't know. And as you say, um, uh, uh, Nancy, yeah. So, uh, sorry, so looking for whose comment that was. A as you said, Nancy, it seems like that would be right up their street, right? The meaning of the word. They're the verbal folks, right? And yet, nope. 
not interested. Um, yeah, yeah, Jennifer, exactly. Jennifer Ewing, you're right that his attitude is patronizing, right? He's treating them as if they are childish, and then he ends up being talked to like a child because he sounded like a child, right? He gave a deliberately childish reason, and as a consequence, uh, felt childish. I agree, David Erbach. Uh, they'll, they're not going to be worshiping him as a deity anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, that does seem distinctly unlikely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree, Devorah. It seems absolutely... I mean, the, the, the conclusion that I think we really kind of have to draw from this passage, right, is that the Hrosa almost certainly know about, you know, the lack of oxygen in space, and they know about the other hundra, and they know about astronomy, because the Sereni have told them, right? They, they must have learned this from the Sereni, because that's the sort of thing that they know. The sort of thing that they know. Again, just think about that phrasing, right? They know one sort of thing. We know another sort of thing, Right? appears to be there. Again, it's not, they don't say they know more than we, they are wiser than we, right? Humans might say that. A servant race, right, might say that of, a, of, of their masters, right? Um, perhaps. Again, they, they might have been trained, so to speak, right? That, that's not the way the crosses speak, right? That's the sort of thing they know. I would be tempted to lay the stress on the they, not as that is the sort of thing they know, but rather that's the sort of thing they know, as contrasted with the sort of thing we know, right? Such as poetry. And that's, of course, exactly where we go from here. Um, they continue to ask questions. Had he come alone? No, he had come with two others of his kind. Bad men. Bent men was the nearest Hrossian equivalent. There is no word for bad in in Hrossian, who tried to kill him, but he had run away from them. The Hrossa found this very difficult, but, all, but finally agreed that he ought to go to Oyarsa. Oyarsa would protect him. Ransom asked who Oyarsa was. Slowly, and with many misunderstandings, he hammered out the information that Oyarsa, one, lived in Meldalorn, two, knew everything and ruled everyone, three, had always been there, and four, was not a Hross, nor one of the Sereni. Then Ransom, following his own idea, asked if Oyarsa had made the world. What's Ransom's idea? Ransom following his own idea, and you can see what his idea was, right? Oh, Oyarsa is their god, right? So now finally he has found the mythology he was looking for, right? Okay, so they have a they have a holy place called Meldalorn that they go to worship Oyarsa, right? Who knows everything and rules everyone. He, I think he's suspecting that it's a mumbo jumbo, like uh, uh, Weston and Divine also both suspected. Exactly, this is the god of their mythology. So, did Oyarsa make the world? The Hrossa almost barked in the fervor of their denial. Did people in Thulkandra not know that Meleldil the Young had made and still ruled the world? Even a child knew that. So they're, um, uh, yeah, no, 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 no. So Oyarsa sounds almost like the kind of local deity that he is expecting in the mythology of a low culture like this, right? and then instead finds that is not the case at all. Exactly, Nancy. Now he's no longer a child. He's a lower level than a child. Yeah, Ransom is getting demoted down the cultural chain, right? No wonder they let him hang out with the pups. Yeah. So here they're still talking. He's still trying to figure out what Mileldo is. He is not a Hnau, said the Hrosa. What is Hnau? asked Ransom. You are now. I am now. The Sereni are now. The Fiffle Triggy are now. Fiffle Triggy, said Ransom. More than ten days' journey to the west, said 
Nora, the Harandra sinks down not into the Handramit, but into a broad place, an open place, spreading every way. Five days' journey from the north to the south of it, ten days' journey from the east to the west. The forests are of other colors there than here. They are blue and green. It is very deep there. It goes to the roots of the world. The best things that can be dug out of the earth are there. The Fifiltrigi live there. They delight in digging. What they dig, they soften with fire and make things of it. They are little people, smaller than you, long in the snout, pale, busy. They have long limbs in front. No now can match them in making and shaping things, as none can match us in singing. But let, but let Hman see. He turned and spoke to one of the younger Hrosa, and presently, passed from hand to hand, there came to him a little bowl. He held it close to the firelight and examined it. It was certainly of gold, and Ransom realized the meaning of Divine's interest in Malacandra. Aha, he gets to the heart of the matter here. Stephen says probably he wasn't babysitting the pups. The pups were babysitting him. Yeah, so you're right, Stephen. They probably had to run uh, additional background checks on their own people, right, uh, who they were putting in charge of Ransom. This also, of course, would explain, uh, David, why he wasn't pitching in around the village, right? <laughs> yeah. I agree, Nancy, that the Fiffle Tricky have the best names. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I agree the association between the Fiffle Triggy and dwarves is very hard to resist. And I don't think that we need resist it entirely, actually. Uh, I think that uh, it is my belief that uh, Lewis is invoking that quite deliberately. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. But we learn that there is... So first of all, the word now is my favorite word from this book. Um, just as there are two words which, uh, two words from the Lapine language of Watership Down, which, you know, have formed, a, you know, part of my core vocabulary that I don't think I could communicate without. Um, of course, Hrare and Tharn being the two words. Um, uh, so now is uh, the word, this is the word I, I really want a Tolkien word that means that, right? Because the word now is the perfect collective word to describe elves and men together. Um, anyway, yeah. So I, 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 I love the word now. It's hard to say. And the word now uh, is just not the same because it sounds too much like the English N-O-W. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, Christie says, between Divine's longing to exploit the world financially and Weston's to exploit it scientifically, I get a very Uncle Andrew vibe from the pair, from the magician's nephew. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, okay. So... So this concept of of now is very important, and as he, um, as he raises the issue of there being now of this this concept of a of a rational species, right? He learns that there's the third one. He's sort of met the serony, which was terrifying and horrifying. Uh, he has met the Hrosa, which has been delightful. And there's apparently a third one, the Fiffle Triggy, right? Um, what do we learn? What do we learn about, not just about the Fiffle Triggy, but about the Hrosa? What do we learn about Malachandrian society from their description of the Fiffle Triggy? And of their production of this artifact, this golden bowl, which is covered with carvings and visual art. What do we learn from this? Those things which Ransom assumed 
right? He's trying to diagnose the cultural level of the society based on a set of, of assumptions that he brings in from, you know, his sense of world history and of anthropology, right? Like that these different cultural abilities will increase together, right? And he was surprised to find art and scientific knowledge in a society which was so crude with its art as far as its artifacts were concerned, right? And now he finds that there is a different culture which produces artifacts. In fact, smelts metals and 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 uh, carves visual art. But they're just separate, right? Yes, and good, Devor, there's more evidence of trade there. Absolutely. Yes, Nancy, and that there's gold in their planet, and nobody seems to care. Um, they pass along this bowl, this fiffle triggy bowl. Um, but there's not really any evidence that this is a like valuable piece, right? That this is a it's not like they're, you know, with great ceremony bringing forth the sacred bowl, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly, Amber. The impression that we're given from this description is that the Hrasa are good at singing and the Fifiltrigi are good at making things. Neither is better than the other. Each one has their role, each one has their value. Right and and yeah the 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 Hrasa don't make things like the fiffle triggy do, but that's okay. The fiffle triggy don't um, don't sing like the Hrasa. But think now, think in terms of Earth history and Earth tendencies that we were discussing before. What's the other significant thing? We've got three societies three separate rational species, one of which has metallurgic technology. Right? What would you expect to see on Earth as a consequence of that? Exactly, John. You'd kind of expect that if there were three societies and one of them was that much more technologically advanced in metallurgy and everything else that they'd have conquered the heck out of the rest of them by now. Exactly. They'd have way better weapons, right? There's no way that the Hrasa could possibly stand up with their old stone age weapons and spears and things like that against, you know, fully armed and armored Fiffle Triggy. Clearly, clearly. But yes, Brian, there's no evidence that if any of these now species seeks to expand into the areas of the others. And that seems to be one of the first things that Hyoi was communicating to him. Remember? Hrasa, Handramid, Sarani, Harandra, right? It's, it's, it, they live over there, and we live over here, and oh, the Fiffle Triggy live over there, and we have our specialty, they have their specialty, we haven't been told explicitly what the specialty of the Sarony is, the only clue we've gotten are all of those, that is the sort of thing they would know, right? So the Sarony appear to be, um, they know things that the others don't know? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and you're right, Stephen, they don't seem to place their specialty or the Fiffle Triggy specialty over the other. They speak with no awe, right, of the Fiffle Triggy because of their ability, right? Um, they clearly value their singing as highly as they value the Fiffle Triggy's delight in digging and in making metal soft and things. Um, and uh, so, and th there's no sense of inferiority. There's no sense of superiority. There's just, we each, we're, there, we're all different species of now, and we each have our specialty. We each have the things that we do. Um, and yes, Brian, as you said, there's no evidence of expansion, right? Which of the Hnau rule, he asked. Oh, Yarsa rules, was the reply. Is he Hnau? This puzzled them a little. The Sarony, they thought, would be better at that kind of question. Perhaps Oyarsa was Hnau, 
but a very different now. He had no death and no young. These Sereni no more than the Hrossa? asked Ransom. This produced more a debate than an answer. What emerged finally was that the Sereni or Sorns were perfectly helpless in a boat, and could not fish to save their lives, could hardly swim, could make no poetry, and even when Hrossa had made it for them, could understand only the inferior sorts. But they were admittedly good at finding out things about the stars and understanding the darker utterances of Oyarsa and telling what happened in Malacandra long ago, longer ago than anyone could remember. Ah, the intelligentsia, thought Ran Ransom. They must be the real rulers, however it is disguised. Right. So, okay. It's queer who's running the show. Right. <clears throat> the Sereni are the scientists. Why do the... Uh, so, clearly... They're the dominant species, right? So he still seems to be suspicious about Oyarsa, right? Um, Oyarsa rules, right? The Sereni probably explained that to you because that's one of the things that they know, right? Yeah. The, oh, uh, understanding the darker utterances of Oyarsa, right? Okay, yes. That they explain to the others, the other lesser species what Oyarsa, who rules everything, really means, right? Got it. Right. Okay. Um. <laughs> Stephen says, the Sereni aren't physically capable, they don't get art, they can't work with their hands, and they value knowledge and trivia. I think I'm part Sorn. How <laughs> you found your tribe, Stephen? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Jennifer uh, Pope, you're absolutely right. Ransom the intellectual assumes that the intellectuals rule and he doesn't even seem to be self-conscious about that. Right. Um, there doesn't he doesn't even seem to stop to think like maybe I'm just kind of assuming that uh, the people like me who, who are, are obviously the ones who are most awesome. And right. And so therefore that's I mean, it's not like it's an irrational uh, uh, conclusion. Right. Um, but um uh, but yeah, no, exactly. The, uh, as Jennifer Ewing and Colette says, the Sorens are the nerds, clearly. Right, absolutely. Um, yes, exactly, John. That that uh, Ransom is exactly imagining a pay no attention to the man behind the curtain situation, right, between the Sorens and the Hrosa. Um Exactly, exactly. Um, so, <laughs> Sarah Grant says, shouldn't Ransom wonder why the intelligentsia don't appreciate poetry? You know, Sarah, I'm tempted to, to suspect that there might be an inside joke here, um, an inside Oxford joke about the philologist not asking that question, or even the philologist not getting the poetic art, right? Um, I, 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 I think that, that there, 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 there could be an inside joke there. Um, uh, anyway, but David, yes, I do kind of suspect that uh, Lewis is is kind of poking fun at himself and his colleagues uh, as he's writing this. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so his his assumptions continue unabated here. Um, Ransom pondered this. So this is. After his conversation with Hyoi about monogamy, about the fact that they only experience love a few times in their life and don't seem to have like this, don't seem to have any other desire for it. Ransom pondered this here, unless Hyoi was deceiving him, was a species naturally continent, naturally monogamous. And yet, was it so strange? Some animals, he knew, had regular breeding seasons. And if nature could perform the miracle of turning the sexual impulse outward at all... Why could she not go further and fix it, not morally, but instinctively, to a single object? He even remembered dimly having heard that some terrestrial animals, some of the lower animals, were naturally monogamous. Among the Hrossa, anyway, it was obvious that unlimited breeding and promiscuity were as rare as the rarest perversions. At last it dawned upon him that it was not they, but his own species, that were the puzzle. That the Hrossa should have such instincts was mildly surprising. But how came it that the instincts of the Hrossa so closely resembled the unattained ideals of that far-divided species man, whose instinct 
instincts were so deplorably different. What was the history of man? Notice the progress of Ransom's assumptions here, right? Again, notice his use of the word lower, right? Um, when he puts the word lower in quotation marks, right? When the narrator puts his Ransom's use of the word lower in quotation marks in the middle of that paragraph is where we begin to see the shift, right? How is it that the Harasa, like, they don't seem to have any temptation or desire towards uh, promiscuity? Towards adultery? Towards infidelity? Right? There's just, it's not an issue at all among them. He even remembered dimly having heard that some of the terrestrial animals, some of the lower animals, were naturally monogamous. Right? I think that that's a kind of a turning point. That's the moment at which his perspective begins to shift. Right? Because that seems to be the moment. Th those quotation marks around lower seem to be the moment when the idea is beginning to creep into his head. Maybe the issue is not that humans are superior to the Hrasa, right? And human culture superior to Hrasian culture. Uh, maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the humans are the lesser culture. Maybe we are lower um, and they are higher than we. Um, and the pivot to that comes in this moment when he's sort of like, well, yeah, actually come to think of it. Yeah, most of the animal species actually behave much better than humans do, right? Um, there's a lot of those animals that we call low animals, which abide by the ideals which we proclaim but don't abide by, right? Um, and of course, that idea is easy to extend, right? Um, that is, there are many things, many acts of cruelty uh, uh, that animals never, ever do to each other, right? And only humans do. Um, now, for the first time, his... He's questioning his deepest assumptions about the relative position of human culture and Hrasa culture. It had literally never occurred to him that the Hrasian culture might be higher than his, right? Um, that these apparently primitive people might be in some ways way ahead of him. We've already seen glimpses of this from the be from that from the beginning scenes where Hyoi is patiently waiting for him to catch on, right? Uh, to uh, their having to explain to him that, you know, that his assumption, his assumption that they have no science and uh, their patient explanation of science to him, their patient explanation of theology to him, right? Um, now he suddenly shifts. Well, we're getting late. Um, I don't want to uh, uh, run too late. We're almost done. We all, I only had... Uh, couple more passages that I wanted to do, uh, but we can finish those up next time. So we'll do the Hanakra hunt uh, and then setting off uh, to uh, uh, towards Meldalorn uh, for next time. And then, of course, uh, we'll get into his journey and meeting the Sorn uh, uh, next time. So um, excellent. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. This was a really fun discussion, and I look forward to continuing it next week. Thanks, everybody. Good night. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.